Prophets have spoken of him from the beginning of time. He is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. He is our high priest, the Lion of Judah, the child born in a manger, the coming king. He is Emmanuel. Well, good morning and happy new year. If you have a Bible with you today, open it up. Go ahead and find your place in Revelation chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible, look in the pew back in front of you. You can use that one there. And if you don't own one at all, please take that one with you, okay? We want that to be a gift from us to you to read it, to use it, to get into God's Word, especially as we begin a new year. There's no better time. Amen? Than to get into the Word of God. And so this morning, we're going to be in Revelation 19, and we are going to conclude a series of messages. For the last four Sundays, we have been looking at portraits in the book of Revelation of Jesus. And so today, we are looking at our fifth picture of Him in Revelation 19. So I'm going to be reading from verses 11 to verse 16. So follow along with me as I read this this portrait of Christ that we see in God's Word. Revelation 19. And then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty." On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You know, if you were here with us last Sunday on Christmas Eve, and you were here for the portrait of Christ that we looked at, we looked at the fact that he is the bridegroom, and we saw this beautiful picture of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so, if you're thinking back to that picture, and then you just listened and read along with our picture today, you may think, you know, those two things don't go together. Right, this beautiful picture, right, of of this extravagant love, this compassion, right, this this picture of Christ the bridegroom pursuing us, the unworthy, impure bride, and that he will stop at nothing to redeem us and to make us his own, even to sacrificing himself on the cross to purchase our redemption. What a beautiful picture that was, right? And then this idea that there is coming a day when the bride will be presented to the bridegroom pure and spotless, and we will be with him for all of eternity. Hallelujah. Right? We got to see that picture last week. Right? Today, I have the fun privilege to get to talk to you about this picture of this mighty warrior, this king coming, not to rescue, but to judge. Sometimes things don't seem to go together. Weddings and warfare, you don't usually put those in the same sentence, right? You don't think about those two things together. But here's what I hope we see today as we, as we go through this passage of Scripture, that these two things, this picture of Christ our bridegroom and this picture of Christ, this warrior king coming to judge are actually very connected. And to understand one is to understand the other more fully. So that's my prayer this morning as we go along. 
You know, when we finished last week, if we had read on just a couple of more verses right before we get to our section today, we see that John, as he's had this vision, he is overwhelmed by it, this picture of the, of the bride and this marriage supper of the Lamb, and he is so moved by this glorious picture of God's love for his church and for his bride. It says that he falls down and he wants to worship the angel that showed him this vision. And the angel says, stop it. You, I am not worthy of worship. I am just a servant of God like you. He says, but let me show you the one who is worthy of worship. And that's who we're going to look at today. Even with some of the intense images that we will see, some of these that are a little hard for us to get our minds around, some things that are going to make us uncomfortable, I want you to understand today that when the angel points out this vision to John of Christ, he has done so setting it up by saying, this is the one, this is the one you should worship. He is the only one worthy of worship. And in our verses, we're going to see several descriptions, right? If this is a portrait of Jesus, each of these are one of the brushstrokes that just paint this picture of Jesus. And so we're going to have to move through these quickly, right? Even though we have one service and it's really tempting to keep you here all day, I can't do that. So I I need to go through these quickly. But I want to just, as we walk through these, point out a few things that help bring into focus for us, who is this one who is worthy of worship. And so, the first thing we read in our passage here in verse 11, it says the heavens are open. That's an important detail. That's an important detail because it says where He comes from. Where has Jesus been? He's been at the right hand of the Father. What is that a place of? What does that signify? It signifies authority. It signifies power, right? We see multiple times, over 16 times in the New Testament, it says that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, right? It signifies that His work of redemption is complete and that He has authority. He is above all, above every name. That is where He comes from. Now. What does it say he comes on? What is he riding? A white horse. Why is that significant that he's riding a white horse? Well, in these times, the white horse was considered the best. Why was it considered the best? Because it is what the conquering emperor and ruler and generals, it's what they would ride back into town on when they had been victorious in battle. It was the horse that signified victory had been achieved. Many times throughout the Old Testament prophecies, we read about the coming Messiah being a victorious warrior. And so, this picture that John gets of Jesus riding on a white horse signifies He is victorious. This image is meant to strike fear into His enemies, but church, it's meant to strike awe into each and every one of us. He is powerful. He is victorious. He is mighty. But then it goes on. It says the next thing it says about him, look at what it says in in verse, and still in verse 11, it says the one sitting on this horse, what is he called? Faithful and true. That name, it stands in stark contrast to all of the rulers that came before him. There is no ruler worthy of that title but Jesus and Jesus alone. Amen? I mean, think about the culture of the day when this was written. The Roman Caesars, right? These emperors, they were cruel. They were self-serving. They were egotistical. They were prideful. They were vengeful. They were not faithful and true by and large. Even the Old Testament kings of God's people, even the best of them, even King David and King Solomon, King Josiah, King Hezekiah, even some of the best of the best, they were not always faithful and true. But this king, this warrior riding in on a white horse, This mighty king who has come, he is the one being presented 
as the king that all humanity has longed for. He is the one. He is the ruler that will set all things right. He is faithful. He is true. He is good. He is the one that all of Scripture has been pointing to. And we see him returning in power in this passage. But we don't just see that his name is faithful and true. We see that in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Starting to get intense. This also, though, stands just like faithful and true would stand in stark contrast to all of the rulers that people would have been familiar with. This one does, too. That in righteousness he judges and makes war. Right? Think about rulers and generals and warriors. Right? They may have accomplished some good and noble things, but there's always, it's always a little bit conflicted, right? Because we read about these guys and, and they've got issues, right? Even if they did some good things, they've got their flaws. This king, this warrior has no flaws. When he comes to make war, when he comes to judge, it is absolutely righteous. No one can question his judgments. No one can stand and say, you are wrong in your assessment. You are wrong in what you do. No, he is absolutely righteous in all that he does. Every other ruler and leader has been marked by contradictions. Right, one of my favorite singer-songwriters, uh, don't judge me for this, not all of his lyrics are, are the most godly in the world, but he has a great line, Chris Christopherson. He says, speaking of an individual, he said, he's a walking contradiction, partly truth and partly fiction, taking every wrong direction on his lonely way back home. Doesn't that describe all of us? That there are certain things, sometimes in our best of moments, we do things right and we do things with good intentions and good motives, but we can't say that to be true of everything that we do. We are not righteous. Scripture says there is no one righteous. No, not one. But that cannot be said of this rider on the white horse, our King Jesus. There is no complexity in him. He is absolutely faithful. He is absolutely true. And he is absolutely righteous in everything that he does. Then it goes on to describe him even more. And it says that his eyes are like flames of fire. Now, remember, Pastor Jason has been telling us each week as we've looked at these portraits, right? These are just, these are symbolic Correct? So when you picture Jesus, King Jesus, you don't picture him with flames for eyes, okay? This is meant to represent something, and it's meant to represent fury. This is passion. This is fury. But it's also meant, as the writer of Hebrews tells us, to let us understand that when it says that he comes with these eyes like flames of fire, that there is nothing hidden from him. The writer of Hebrews says that he sees all, and he says that all must give an account to him. So when this king comes riding on the white horse, he has come to make war and to judge, and he has come, and all must give an account to him because he is faithful, he is true, and he is righteous. And there is nothing hidden from him. And now everyone in the room is uncomfortable. (laughs) Because we like to think that maybe there are some things that are hidden from him in my life. Church, there is nothing hidden from him. It goes on to say that on his head are many diadems. What in the world is a diadem? It's a crown. A diadem would represent a a kingdom, a territory, a place that you ruled over, that you had authority over. And so if he is wearing many diadems, what does that symbolize? Absolute authority. 
over all. He is sovereign and has dominion over all things, right? If we were going to study in depth the book of Revelation here, we would, we would understand, we would remember that when it t- speaks about the dragon and the beast of the sea, they are also wearing diadems. They are ruling and they, they, have, they have authority, but theirs are limited. One has seven and one has ten. But King Jesus has many. It is this symbolism, this, this significant measure for us to take note that he has dominion over all. There is nothing that he does not rule and reign over. He has absolute authority. Then it goes on to say that he has a name that no one knows but himself. Now, this really could talk to us about several things. I just want to touch on them for just a moment because our time just won't allow us to, to talk about these in depth. But saying that he has a name that no one knows but himself, this absolutely points to his divinity, to his transcendence, that he is above all things, that yes, he has revealed himself to us in his incarnation, in the person of Christ. God has revealed himself to us, but there are things that we can never know about him because he is so other than you and I, that he is beyond our comprehension to truly understand his magnificence. This also could be pointing to what Paul writes about in Philippians chapter 2 when he says that God has given Jesus a name that is above every name and that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that he is Lord. It is a name that only he possesses. We also see some ties to earlier in Revelation where it says in Revelation 2 that the churches, that the saints, they have been given a new name that is also hidden, that only they know, only those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb know that name. And it won't be until He returns in judgment that everyone will see and everyone will know who He truly is. But this name that he possesses, that no one knows but himself. It is above every name. It is above every name. He who humbled himself, Philippians says, that God exalts him high above all. Now, it gets even more intense as this picture continues to develop. It says that this rider on the white horse, King Jesus, his robe is dipped in blood. Robe dipped in blood. Now, this imagery we're going to see in just a few minutes comes straight from Isaiah 63. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. But for now, we've got to ask a question. And here's the question you need to ask. Whose blood is his robe dipped in? So go ahead. Okay, let's get it together. Ready? Whose blood? There we go. Good job. Whose blood is his robe dipped in? Now, other places in Revelation, when we see his robe in in this imagery, it's his blood. It's his own blood that he shed on the cross to purchase our redemption. But not this time. This time, the blood that his robe is dipped in, that stains his garments, is that of his enemies. That he is slain in judgment as he's come to do battle with all of those who stood against him and refused to bow their knee to King Jesus. This is getting intense, is it not? Here he comes, and we want to celebrate, oh, King Jesus has returned, and he absolutely has. But he sees all. He is above all. He has absolute authority, and he comes this time to judge. And his robe is dipped in the blood of those he comes to judge. This picture gets graphic. But then it goes on 
We're going to come back to that one in just a minute, but it goes on to say, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. Now, this is a favorite name for John to use. John, who wrote the gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he loves to use this picture of Jesus as the Word, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us. This, this imagery is, is so crucial, right? It's, it's pointing to the fact that, right, that when Jesus came the first time in His incarnation, He came to rescue He came to lay down his own life so that we could be redeemed, so that we could escape the wrath and judgment of God. But when the Word of God comes this time, as we are reading in Revelation, he is not coming to rescue. Now the Word symbolizes him coming with authority and to decisively execute judgment. He is the final Word. I love this quote by Charles Spurgeon, and at Christmas time in this season, it's particularly uh, important to, 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 these words are so important. It says, those little hands in the manger will one day grasp the scepter of universal power. Those little feet in the manger shall tread on the serpent's neck and crush his head. He is the final word. Now, the next verse, verse 14, guess what? It talks about these, this army of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, who were following him on white horses. We don't have time to go into that, but guess who that is? That's us. But we didn't come to fight. We're just watching. We're following along. But this picture, right, in, 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 our, in our picture last week, talking about the bride, same language, right? Arrayed in fine linen, pure and white. Here we are riding behind, following the mighty warrior, riding on the white horse as he comes to conquer and to execute judgment on all those who have opposed him, right? It says we are with him in that. So if those first pictures, descriptions we looked at describe who the one is that is worthy of worship, these next three are going to tell us about the activity of the one who is worthy of worship. And if you thought the first ones were intense, just buckle your seatbelt if you got one there in the pew, okay? Because um, these are going to get even more hard to, to process and deal with. It says in verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. Again, disclaimer, there's not a real sword coming from the mouth of Jesus, right? It's it's imagery, right? The sharp sword from his mouth. This is also Old Testament prophetic imagery that's used to prophesy about the coming messianic king. The New Testament picks up on this language as well because it describes Christ as waging war against his enemies in dealing with sin and dealing with lawlessness. So what is this sharp sword? This sharp sword symbolizes the lethal power of his word in dealing with his enemies. He will deal with them decisively. He will deal with them violently, right? I mean, think about battles that you've watched where swordplay, you know, you don't just get nicked, right, and scraped a little bit, right? This, it's, this is intense. He, and he will come with a sharp sword to deal with his enemies. He also will come, and it says he will rule with a rod of iron, Again, more Old Testament, Old Testament imagery about the Messiah. This one comes right out of Psalm chapter 2, where it says that he will rule with a rod of iron. That doesn't mean to govern sternly. It means to destroy. When he comes with a rod of iron, it is unyielding. It is unbending. When he uses this rod of iron, it is to destroy those who oppose him. You know, Jesus, 
It would be so fun to stand here today and talk to you about Jesus as the good shepherd who comes to care for his sheep. Amen? It'd be a lot more comfortable for me to talk to you about that today. I can tell you that. And he absolutely does come to care and to provide and to lead his sheep to good pasture. But if he is a good shepherd, he also carries a rod with which to strike everything that would threaten the safety and the security and the well-being of his sheep. And that is what we see here in this passage. He has come to judge and to rule with a rod of iron and to destroy everything that opposes his bride and his purposes in this world. He is passionate for his glory, and he is passionate for those he has redeemed. And so this rod of iron will be taken up to strike down anyone who opposes this king who comes riding in. And then we're coming back now to Isaiah 63, because here it says, He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Now, in this, I want you to take your Bible, if you've got it, and turn to Isaiah 63, because we're going to look at this in just a moment. In Isaiah chapter 63, we see this picture, the same language used. Our portrait of Christ is the rider on the white horse with his robe dipped in blood. Why is it dipped in blood? Because he's been executing judgment by crushing his enemies and spilling their blood. Well, in Isaiah chapter 63, we read in this prophecy about something that John is pointing to, saying that what Jesus is doing when he comes is exactly what Isaiah is talking about here in chapter 63. Now, time's not going to permit us to go into this in depth, I just need to give you a little bit of context, though, and if you want to go back and read this further, I encourage you to do so. But in the context of Isaiah chapter 63, Isaiah is speaking about the putting right of wrongs that have been done to God's people, particularly by this people of Edom. Now, these people of Eden, especially we read about this in Ezekiel chapter 25, these people, when Israel was vulnerable, when Babylon had come in and destroyed Jerusalem and they were being taken into captivity, Edom swooped in and began to take advantage of, of Judah in their vulnerable condition. And in Isaiah 63, we read about God taking action on behalf of his people, and he comes it says on this day of vengeance, and what is it he comes to do? To execute justice for retribution. And so this vengeance that we read about in Isaiah 63 is what John points to, to say, now what Jesus comes to do with his enemies is very much like what we see in Isaiah chapter 63. So, I want us to take note of three things in this text. Look at verse 1 with me for just a moment. It says at the end of verse 1, it says that the one speaking, this one who's come, who has come from executing judgment, whose robes are crimson because of, of what he has done by treading upon his enemies and shedding their blood, it says, it is I speaking in righteousness who is mighty to save. Now, it is stated that he is mighty to save. It is shown for us in graphic detail that he is mighty to judge. Both can be true. Both are true. Church, this is a sad state that we are in, but it is so important to point this out that our tendency is toward a sanitized version of the gospel that wants to highlight the love and mercy and grace of God in salvation and minimize the holiness and wrath of God against sin. And when we do that, it only serves to weaken the message of the gospel and actually make it no gospel at all. 
See, the portrait we saw last week of the extravagant love of God and the love of Christ, our bridegroom, making us ready, we can't understand that picture properly if we don't appreciate and consider his absolute holiness and his utter hatred for sin and his overarching purpose to eradicate anything that would stand in the way of him redeeming his creation. We must understand both, or we don't have a full picture of the love of God in Christ Jesus in the gospel. Amen? Amen. Now, in verse 3, look over, look there, it says, he has trodden the winepress. Look at that next word, alone. Just like the work of salvation belongs to Christ alone, we bring nothing to the table. Amen? We bring our sin. We are dead in our sin and trespasses. He alone saves. Church, he alone is the only one who has the authority and the right to execute eternal judgment. He is the only one. If time permitted, we would look on further in our text in Revelation, and we would see how John sets in in contrast to each other the marriage supper of the Lamb, and what we would see in verses and on in Revelation, what is called the feast of God. And it is this picture of those who have stood in his way, that that the warrior has come, King Jesus has come to execute judgment. Now he feeds the flesh of his enemies to the birds. It's grotesque. And it is tragic because it didn't have to be. Because you see, Romans tells us that Christ came to save us from the wrath of God's judgment. Right? Because we were objects of wrath, but those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus and bowed our knee in submission and surrender to him, we are no longer objects of wrath because we have been redeemed. But those who refuse to bow the knee, those who live in rebellion and opposition to him, there is coming a day. They could have been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, but instead... They are eradicated by God's judgment. And we're meant to weep over this picture. Only Christ can execute that judgment, but make no mistake, he will. His his character demands that he do so. Verse 4 of Isaiah chapter 63. I want you to notice the disparity between the quantities of time that are listed in this verse. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. Church, God does not love punishing sinners, but he does love vindicating his redeemed. He will. I love this picture right? because we see his grace and his mercy highlighted. This year of redemption, this day of vengeance. But that day is coming. Our world is crying out for justice, for, for relief, for the oppressed, for retribution to be served for those who are persecuted and trodden down. J- just Christmas morning in Nigeria. Did you see on the news that over 160 Christians were killed by jihad forces? Over 200 homes were destroyed. Over 300 people are injured, and the numbers are still climbing. But did you also know that this is just one incident in a string over two decades where over 62,000 Christians have been slaughtered by the jihadist forces? And over 5 million have been displaced. And that's just one place in our world. Our world groans for righteousness, for justice, for wickedness to be dealt with. The character of God demands that he deal with it. 
He cannot turn, he cannot be loving and good and holy and just if he just turns a blind eye to sin. He must deal with it. But yet, the character of God and the tension here is hard for us to get our minds around. On one hand, we love mercy and grace, but on the other hand, when some wrong has been done to us, we want justice. And we say, God, why have you not acted? But then other times we're like, God, please don't. Spare, spare, spare me, right? What we see, the fact that he has not already come and executed judgment on the wicked also speaks to his character. The fact that he will do that speaks to his character, but the fact that he has stayed his hand of judgment right now also speaks to his character. And Peter, I believe, describes this so well in 2 Peter chapter 3. Let me read for you these verses. Starting in verse 7, but earth that was the earth that now, by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He must avenge. He must deal with wickedness, and he will, and he will do so decisively. And those who have not surrendered to Jesus will have to give an account. They will stand before him. And scripture says, and they will be destroyed. But the love of God wishes that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the fact that he has not already come to deal with it once and for all, we must take note that that is his patience and his kindness that is allowing everyone an opportunity to hear the message of the gospel and to bow their knee in submission to King Jesus before it is too late. The final brushstroke in our picture, go back to Revelation 19. It says he has a name that is written on his thigh and on his robe. And what is that name? King of kings, Lord of lords. He's sovereign. He is the warrior, the King Jesus. He has ultimate victory over all of his enemies. We see this title in other places in Scripture. It goes all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 10 when Moses declared to Israel that the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords. What is it helping to spotlight for us? All the things that we've talked about so far. He is the only one who is mighty to save. He is the only one qualified to execute his eternal judgment. And he is the only one who is worthy of our worship. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. So what's our response? What is our response to this portrait, to this picture of Jesus? Because it is an intense picture, is it not? It is one that makes us uncomfortable. We would much rather think of his grace and his mercy and think less of his judgment. But they are so connected that we must consider them both in order to understand who he is and what he is doing. And when I think about how we should respond, I cannot help my mind. I tried all week to fight it, but I couldn't. My mind cannot help but go to the Chronicles of Narnia. Blame my mother. She read them to me as a young child. Actually, it's some of my sweetest memories of her reading all seven of these stories by C.S. Lewis to me. I've done it with my children. I love these stories. 
They're so rich, and they've got so many pictures that point us to Jesus. And in this series of books, the Christ figure in the books, if you're not familiar with them, is the lion Aslan. And in in here, he is portrayed through all the books as being both intolerably severe and irresistibly tender. He is both at the same time. Now, even if you've not read them, you may have heard a quote from one of those books, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where Aslan is described. And it's asked about him, is he safe? And the response is, who said anything about being safe? Of course he isn't safe. He's a lion, but he's good. And he is the king, I tell you. Now, as we read these books in in Narnia, it is very clear about Aslan that he is not a tame lion, that he can't be tied down, he can't be controlled, he can't be manipulated, he can't be bullied. He commands absolute respect and obedience from everyone. And to the wicked, he is extremely dangerous. But yet at the same time, he shows compassion and kindness. He's forgiving and loving, and he will stop at nothing to protect and to preserve his land of Narnia. Now, we got to be careful, right? Jesus is not to equate Jesus with Aslan. He is not Aslan, but these pictures are helpful for us to see. And there's an important truth that we need to understand. Jesus is not a tame God. He is not a God of your own making that has to fit neatly into a box that you're comfortable with. He is not beholden to you. He is not beholden to me. Just because I don't like that he must come to execute judgment doesn't mean that he is not absolutely right in doing so. Just because he doesn't act when I want him to act does not mean that he is wrong and I am right. He is not beholden to me. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. So what does that tell us about him? We've seen it today. He is the rider on the white horse. So what should we do? We should marvel at his glory and respond to him as his children, as his bride. We should respond to him in lives of worship. What better time than the day before we begin a new year to stop and just marvel at the glory and the magnificence of this triumphant king who comes to make all things right, but to say, I'm on his side. I serve him. My life is not my own. My head needs to be lifted, and I need a different perspective. I don't need to get so bogged down in the cares of this world, but I need to remember that I serve a victorious king who is going to come and once and for all execute judgment on this sinful world, and I will be victorious because he is victorious. And so today, I can live in victory, and I can live my life to serve him and not to serve myself. That is a response that we should have to this portrait of Jesus. Another one, that he comes and he does triumph over his enemies. We should be encouraged today. Whatever you are walking through, take courage. If you are dealing with the effects of a fallen world today in really heavy ways, if you're dealing with loss and sickness, dysfunction in a relationship, right? Cares and struggles of this world, if they are just weighing you down, this portrait serves to give you courage. He is victorious, right? Darkness may last for a moment, but joy comes in the morning because He will come to rule and to reign and to make all things right. And He gives us His Spirit by which we can persevere while we await that day. And the fact that he will judge and that he will do so with finality, with power, that also, as contradictory as it may feel to you in your mind, that also should encourage you to understand 
that he will deal with the wrongs that we see in our world. And it is not up to us to deal with them. He will deal with them. We can live in faithfulness to him. But this picture that he will come to judge, that he will deal with sin once and for all, for those of you sitting in this room today who have never bowed your knee to Jesus and surrender, to say, Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner and that your word, what it says about me is true, that I am your enemy because of my sin. Today, I want to, if you have never responded to him and to say, today, I acknowledge my sin. I confess it, and I believe, Jesus, that your death on the cross paid for my sin, and I bow my knee to you as my king, as my Lord, to follow you with all the, through all the days of my life. If you have never done that, then this portrait today ought to be the wake-up call for you to be reminded that when the day of judgment comes, there is none that will escape. If you have not bowed your knee to Jesus before that day, you will bow on that day. But you have a choice. While it is still today, you have a choice that you can make. And that is to no longer be an object of wrath to a holy God, but to come under the blood of Jesus Christ and to be covered and redeemed by that blood. So now you are like the portrait we saw last week. The bride who is spotless and righteous before her bridegroom because he has made her so. So what are you going to do? How are you going to respond? The truth about Jesus that we need to think about this morning as our praise team comes. As they come, we're going to sing one final song. But there's a truth that we need to understand from our picture today that I believe will be so good for us as we approach a new year. This perspective could be something that opens up your relationship with Christ to a whole new level of intimacy and purpose and confidence and security that maybe you've never experienced before. Because the truth about Jesus is not first and foremost fundamentally that he is an angry God who sets this impossible standard and then punishes us when we fail to live up to it. That's not the portrait we saw. It's also not a portrait that Jesus is willing to ignore evil in our lives as if it were really no big deal. And it's even not a picture that he is both equally loving and just. But here's the picture that we saw. The truth is that God is love. Because he is love, he will be just. Because he is love, he will punish sin. But church, here's the beautiful thing. But he will stop at nothing to save us from those sins. So where are you today as we close out 2023? Can you say in worship, hallelujah, I belong to King Jesus. And so I need to be reminded today of the victory that is mine because of the victory that is his. And I need to live this next year walking in victory, walking in confidence, living my life with purpose, serving him while I await his return. Is that the response? It's just a fresh perspective as we begin a new year? Is the response today to understand that no, he is holy and his holiness demands that sin be dealt with. And today you need to have your sin dealt with. Does today need to be the day of salvation for you where you bow your knee to King Jesus? As we sing this song, I'm gonna pray for us and then we're gonna stand and sing. And as we do, I wanna invite you to respond. Whether you want to use these steps as an altar to just pray, 
to just lay some cares before the Lord, to confess some wrong views you've had of him, and just to, just to confess and agree with what we have seen today, to say, I need that to change my thinking. I need that to change my behavior. You can use these steps as an altar if, if it would be helpful for you to do that, or you can do it right where you sit. If you need to pray with someone, we're going to have counselors here at the front who would love to pray with you. If today needs to be the day of salvation for you and you want to talk to someone about how you can give your life to Jesus, we would love to talk with you about that. I can't tell you how to respond. I can only tell you that in light of the portrait we have seen of Jesus today, you must respond to him. So let me pray for us, and then we're going to sing together. Father, we thank you today for this magnificent picture we have seen of you, this conquering warrior, this King of kings and Lord of lords who will deal with sin. But Jesus, we thank you that you have already come and you dealt with the penalty of sin so that those of us who would surrender to you could escape the wrath that your holiness demands and we could be purchased by your blood redeemed by you. Thank you that you made a way for sinners to be washed clean, for those who were your enemies to be your friends, for those who were outcasts to be adopted into your family. Jesus, we thank you today that that is who you are. We also thank you that you are holy and you are just and you are righteous. You are mighty. Thank you that we serve a mighty God. As we worship you today, may you be glorified even in our response this morning. Would you stand with me as we sing?